welcome. And today we will have a second lecture on Golang. And we will try to cover uh, the fundamental constructs of the language. And to demonstrate that, I came up with a simple, um, simple project I will show you in the repository. Uh, yeah, here. And the project is called Students, and it has uh, the following specification. So we would like to have four different types of entities, a person which has name, surname, age, and unique ID, personal ID, uh, a student who has a unique student ID, but a student is a person, a teacher who is also a person, and teacher has a unique teacher ID, and the teachers have budget, which they can use to pay assistants for work, an assistant is also a person. Uh, an assistant uh, has a unique assistant ID. And assistants have money account to which uh, teachers can pay money. And then anybody, the actual entities in the system can play one of those uh, four roles or many of them. So for example, we have uh, Marius and Chris who are teachers. We have Alice and Charlie who are students and we have Bob and Bob is a student, but Bob is also a teaching assistant, such that Marius or Chris can pay Bob for, for teaching uh, help, right? So this is the kind of the requirement. And to demonstrate that the system works, uh, you need to have uh, a main function, which demonstrates that it works. And you have to have some use cases working, like that Marius pays Bob, and Bob cannot pay himself because Bob is not a teacher. Uh, be, even though Bob is the teaching assistant, uh, and Marius cannot pay Bob more than the budget allows. And the default budget is like 100 units, or 100, uh, let's say, Bitcoins. <laughs> I was Norwegian Krona, that would not be worth uh, working for. So um, that's our spec. And then we will basically write, the, write the, the system. So I can demonstrate how the system works. So I build it, I've uh, written the dub already. And if I run students, uh, you will see I have a small user interface with like command line uh, like interaction. So I can get help to, to see all the commands that I can do and finishes the session. And then I can add person so I can add Alice uh, down age 32. And I can add student. Uh, so let's have Bob Dylan, I don't know, 34. And then I can list students. I only have one student at the moment, which is Bob. And I can list uh, people, which in that case, I have two people because Alice is a person and Bob is a person. So I have Alice and Bob, right? I can add another person. Person Marius uh, Johansson, 45. And then if I list teachers, I will see uh, no teachers because I added a person, but we don't have any teachers yet. So if I list people, I will have three people. Uh, people zero, one, and two. Uh, those are kind of uh, unique indexes, like personal numbers of those people, but I don't have any teachers. So I can have uh, make teacher and I can make Marius Johansen a teacher. So press two. So make teacher uh, two. And then if I list teachers, I will have one. Right, so I have a teacher with the teacher ID zero, and the account of the teacher is 100, and the person ID of the teacher is two, and that's his um, details. So the system works. It took me about two hours to implement it. So if I were to re-implement everything from scratch now, um, it would take longer because I will be ranting about how, I, how things work and what I'm doing. So I will not implement everything from scratch, but I will show you kind of the core elements and then I will commit the code such that you can see all the other missing pieces uh, in the repository here. So this is our spec. And I can see here that 
I sort of need um, to organize my, my work, right? I need to organize what will I need when I am implementing this assignment. Um, so first things first, um, what's the difference between uh, professional runners and amateur runners or hobbyists who run for fun? What's the, what's the difference? between professionals and hobbies or amateurs. Any ideas? Yeah, the professionals are being paid for their job. What else? Skills often, yeah. Hours committed, yes, hours committed. So the there are many differences, of course. Um, being paid is not actually uh, one of them because you can be very professional and not be really paid for it. Um, and then you can do things as a hobbyist and be paid for it as well, right? Uh, that's not re really the, the main differentiator, but the hours committed and tracking your time is important such that professional runners or whoever is doing things professionally will almost always track everything they do and commit a lot of hours into their tasks and their craft, and they will kind of use that data to improve their, um, their, their, their craft, right? So I, I cannot stress it enough that if you are thinking about kind of a professional programming career or doing something in IT, you do need to track your time uh, because knowing how long certain things take uh, allow you to predict how much you need to charge your customers for and also how can you do in a given unit of time. Uh, so I almost religiously track my time every time I'm doing any programming things. And as I said, it took me a little bit over two hours to do this assignment, right? Um, so I encourage you every time, every time you're doing something programming wise, you track your time. You don't need to tell anybody. You don't need to kind of uh, be public about it. You're doing it for yourself. Uh, and it helps you to, to gauge uh, the difficulty of the task such that you can be more predictable for yourself. So anyway, um, I need to organize my project. So, okay, of course I need kind of uh, the main uh, module. And then I have to ask myself, uh, will I be okay with just a flat structure with in a, everything in a single file or in a single folder? Or do I see a complexity that kind of, uh, uh, will be beneficial for me to structure it into packages. And my attitude towards that is that I have some sort of a data model. Uh, and in this data model, I have kind of a four distinct entities and I have this concept of some sort of database and I have to keep track of indexes of, of something. So it would probably make sense to me. And also I only have one main. So I only have to have one fun, like one executable which demonstrates the whole system, right? So to me, an organization which has kind of a main and the top level and then logic and packages kind of makes sense. Uh, so I will, um, I will create a folder. So I will make a folder students and I will initialize it, uh, go mod init students. Uh, and that's my main module. So I currently have um, only, uh, crap, I, I, I run go mod in it in a wrong place. So I have to move uh, go mod into students. I didn't enter the folder, students. Okay, so again, I am just having a single file. Uh, it's a um, go mod and the go mod is just saying, yeah, we have a module students and and go right why do i do it in command line well i do it in command line because when i open it with ide ide will already know it's a go project it's using modules and it will prompt me about kind of uh things that it needs you know to wire me up with um so i kind of like to prepare it beforehand such that the ID will do what it needs to do kind of automatically. Yes, you can open the IDE and say new project and Golang project and kind of try to navigate with the mouse, but I kind of try, tend to like doing it with the keyboard. So then I will kind of um, open the project. So I will go here. I will navigate um, to where my project is. So projects, uni, proc 205, 2022, students, 
and single, fo single file, go mod. I'll open it. And we'll wait for it to do what it needs to do. And now we can start organizing our our project. So, so the commands I'm executing are the Golang related commands, uh, the ones which are like, for example, go mod init uh, or go build. Those are the same for every operating system. Uh, creating a folder like make direct directory. Um, I don't remember how you create directories in Windows, actually, <laughs> in command line, to be honest. It might be slightly <laughs> different. Um, so come on, Windows people, tell people how to create folders in Windows. Um, so on Bash, it's make, di uh, make directory. Uh, and that's typical for Mac OS and Linux-like operating systems. On Windows, I think it's the same, but I am not 100% sure. On Windows, to list folders on, on Unix, like in Bash, you say ls. On Windows, you say dir, right? So dir kind of lists the files in your directory. Uh, so there are small differences between Windows and um, Bash. Right, so coming back here, um, let's see the specs again. So I need... Um, I like to start with doing a main such that I get kind of a logical overview of what will my application need. So I don't create um, the, the, the things first. I create how it will feel to use them first such that it kind of is easier to, uh, to implement the API properly, right? So what I would usually do is I would say, I have a new Go file. I will call it main.go. You don't have to call it main. But it communicates that um, you know if you have a file called main, um, it will most likely contain the entry point, right? So whoever is re reviewing the code will see, oh yeah, where is main? And if something is called main.go, it will be yeah, the main is probably here. It's not necessary to name your fi to file main. Uh, it asks me if I want to add the um, the files to Git. I usually do it by hand. You can use IDE to do this. Um, I usually do everything which I can in the command line. Um, okay, so in here, what I will do is I will say, I will have a function main and then that's my main entry point. And then I will need, so, so how my app will work? Well, I have to have some form of database, right? So I usually would like to call something like init to initialize my database. And then I would need to uh, populate it with some um, uh, you know, dummy data. Or in this case, I want to work with an empty one and then have some sort of a command processor, which uh, will accept, which will print this. Uh, so print prompt. Uh, and then it will kind of a process um, commands, right? So that, that's kind of my logic. I, I would imagine that I will have to have some sort of database. I will have to have some sort of um, a prompt for saying like what the user can do. And then I will have some function which take the database and processes the commands such that I, you know, whatever I'm, I'm saying, like creating new person and so on, it, it happening, right? So that means I need to have, um, a variable here called db, which is something, right? What is db? Well, it will be a pointer to some sort of a db type, right? Or it could be an instance of a db struct. Don't worry about it for now. Um, and then I need two functions, uh, print, print prompt and process commands. Okay, so 
that kind of feels nice. Um, it will almost compile. I am missing this uh, struct, right? So I can create stuff here, but because I have this um, concept of database and also of the model of my people, like person, student, and so on, it makes sense to me to partition it into a separate package and declare what this is uh, in a separate package. So what I will do is I will create new folder, new directory. I will call it DB. Uh, and I will create a new file inside the DB. So new go file, and I will call it db.go. So where is the, I will not add it to Git yet. And then I will say, okay, um, this is my DB package and I need a type, which is a struct, which is DB and sorry, uh, struct. And it's currently empty, right? So to declare a structure in Golang, you like in C like languages, you would say struct, and then you would have the kind of the fields. In Golang, you say, I'm declaring a type. The type is called DB, and it has the actual type behind uh, what DB is after. And here I would declare what fields it has. It has. I don't have any fields, so that's I will save it. I will go back to my main, and then if I go here to to use this type which I just declared, I have to use the I have to use the um, DB prefix, right? So I have to say I'm using a package DB, which is uh, exposing the capital B for me. So in here, I declared a public type, which is sort of an empty struct. And here I'm using, um, I'm using um, that empty type to initiate, initiate a, a variable. And to be able to do that, I have to say um, import db and that almost worked um yeah so also one comment because we are talking about main and we remember from previous lecture uh main needs to live if it is supposed to be an entry point it needs to live in the main package so i need to change that uh, and then as for the DB, um, no, that, that's a good hint. So there, there is a comment in the, in the chat that my import is, uh, is wrong. Um, and it's indeed wrong because my import has to be in a form of module slash package. Uh, remember, my our module is called this. So in your Go mode, you have the module name here. Uh, and then in the import, you would say students slash DB. Uh, double check. Yes. All right, let's see if that likes it better. Not really. Uh, so let's see what's wrong. So let's debug it. We need to check if the project structure has um, uh, go. So did not recognize properly that my um, project is. I think, I think I you wrote that wrong. So, say it again? Not, uh, it should be db.db, not db.bd on line 14. Yeah. But why the import is not working? Let's fix the import first. Um, product structure.
Uh, let's see. So let me do, because I can try to find where it is. Let me do a trick if I close the project and I reopen it. Uh, maybe it will recognize and ask me. It asked me before, I don't know if you've noticed, like it asked me if I want to set the root of the project to a particular Golang and I didn't click it on time. And now I'm kind of a little bit um, regretting it. <laughs> um, so let me see. It thinks it's a Haskell project. That's what the project SDK says, and that is wrong. So if I say, uh, yeah, I can try this. Um, uh, yes, let's try this one. And then can I pick a different goal? Yeah, uh, let's. It should prompt me that there is a new Golang. That one is fine. That one is fine. That one is not importing the project. So just to like I told you, like if you have some problems uh, and to identify if the problem is with you or with the with your code or with the ID, what you can do is you can go and build your project. Um, and then if the pro project is uh, LS, so the package, mm, yeah, I don't see the problem yet. Any ideas? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it doesn't know that I'm using modules. That was also a typical problem. I'm kind of happy I'm doing it with you guys because you will be fighting this as well. Um, so let's see. That's totally wrong. Uh, modules. I I hate IDs. Okay, so let me try to fix that one. Um. Yeah, so that's the, yeah, so even though it says the name is 14, the truth to be said is actually 17.6, because if you go, if I try that version, that's the problem. It's not here. So where is go? Where is my go? Uh, it's user local bin go. So user local bin. Uh, not editable. No SDK. Yeah, I have. Let's see. So with Golang, it's a little bit tricky. They have support for Java, but not that. Um... Um... 
Yeah, so there are some suggestions about the um, about let's see. So let's not use this at all. Let's not use that at all yet. Let's see if that builds. Files up to date. Let's see. So go build. Yes, go build students. Yare, yare, yare. Apply. Okay. So let's try that. What do you need? Manage targets. No. Run package. Edit. So run. Configuration is incorrect. What is incorrect? Error package is not specified. Yes. So write a directory instead. Let's try that. Okay, so that works. Um, that works fine now. So if I comment that one out and say, okay, so what you're suggesting, yeah, maybe go go lang uh, is a bit easier. Package is wrong in the DB. The package is called DB, so that is fine. Uh, the main package is called main, such that we have the entry point, and this one is fine. So uh, let's try it. This one is undefined because we're not importing it. Import students and db db is a typo yes thank you that was the problem um yeah so that's one problem uh another problem is this one is not used so process commands has to accept db uh, db good so we have that almost sorted and this import is still not working in id let me try if it builds here it builds so as you see the code is fine because it builds in command line uh, but ide has kind of um uh, got a little bit out of sync with something uh, and doesn't recognize that that import is fetching correct package. Um, again, sometimes restarting IDs helps. I will restart it. Um, good that I wrote the whole thing before the lecture uh, because we would definitely not manage in two hours this time around. Um, I'm not a big fan of big IDs, to be honest, for those reasons. Uh, like you see them being kind of here like a winner. Uh, we would have been already much more productive. But yes, with bigger projects, IDs sometimes are making you more productive. So I, I see why people are using it. 
All right, so it likes my code now. Okay, some lessons. If, if you fight with your IDE and your code is correct because you confirmed that it builds and it's fine, well, yeah, maybe you need to restart the bloody thing. Okay, so let's let's continue. Uh, so we have uh, partitioned our logic into the DB file, which currently doesn't have anything. And then we kind of made a skeleton for us to, to see in the um, uh, main.go such that we can uh, keep building it and keep testing some of the ideas that we have, right? I have one thing here, which is red, which says db.init. Okay, so let's stop here for a moment. Um, having a struct uh, in, as a type, that's relatively straightforward, right? We have some sort of um, um, uh, struct type, which can contain some elements inside. Um, and then we would like to use it, right? So if I want to have a variable uh, of, that, of that type, I kind of uh, created with this um, uh, special assignment for DB, which is kind of equivalent for me to do, um, for me to be doing this, like I can split it into two lines saying DB is a variable of type DB. And then uh, this line, uh, sorry, I have to say db.db. And then this one is basically assigning kind of um, uh, an instance of this, of this struct to this variable. So if I do that with the, with this colon here, I can delete the first line because then uh, Golang kind of infers the type and generates the, um, the type binding for me. Um, so then if I have a function, I have uh, two ways of calling that function. So one way of calling the function you see here, I can pass the struct as a parameter to a function and I'm kind of doing it, doing it here, right? So I have a, a, a variable which is of struct and I'm calling it here. Um, but in some occasions, we would like to continue using this kind of uh, a dot notation, which is more like ca coming from um, C++ or Java, where I have some sort of object and I'm calling the function on that object, right? So if you, if I, um, if I delete this print um, prompt for a moment, uh, those two lines, um, let's say I have, initialize and then pass db. Okay, maybe like this. So this calling convention is calling a function in it on the object db. And this calling convention is calling a function, let, let's call it in it as well, okay. On the database object, right? They are totally equivalent. They are exactly the same. Um, so what's the difference? Why to pick one over the other? Um, it depends on the context and, the, uh, and how you're using it. So does it make sense to have a function in it which will take something else? W will the function in it be more uh, reusable or polymorphic onto some other types? Or is the behavior of init method only specific to the database? Well, in this case, it's only specific to the database. Uh, I'm not um, having kind of some sort of a function here, like a uh, func in it, which takes a DB or it kind of is, there is another func uh, in it, which takes potentially some other polymorphic type, right? I'm not playing any kind of um, uh, dispatch on the function call. Uh, the behavior of the init, the logic is only attached to the, to the database, in which case we prefer this calling convention, right? So for this calling convention, I have to declare it together with my struct. So if I go back here, now I have to declare what the function init does. And I do that like this. I will have a function in it. It doesn't take any parameters and it does something. And it looks like a normal function, but to make it like, you know, the init which takes the database as a parameter would look like this, right? Uh, but the I don't have to say db dot, uh, sorry. I don't have to say db dot db here because I'm already in this package. So I am already in this naming um, 
uh, namespace. So if I say DB, then that would be equivalent uh, to the, uh, the second way of calling functions. Uh, but if I'm saying, no, I will not pass it as a parameter, I will have a, a kind of a method call on it. Then I say, I say this. And then de declares uh, a, a, <clears throat> a method in it on top of the struct, which is on, on top of the type, which is the first parameter here. So I have the keyword func, which means I'm defining a function. This defines what the function will be called on. So in, in our case, it will be called on the database object. And then I have the parameters and then I have the return type. So then if I do this, then uh, my I can call my function in it on, on the database, right? So if we want to modify, manipulate something inside that struct um, and I'm calling it by um, I'm calling it by value here. Um, then at this line here, uh, all that all the uh, state manipulation which happened on this value type would be gone. And here I may not have um, the required changes, right? So that that refers to the uh, concept of uh, reference and value types. Um, I hope you did the Golang tour. Uh, if you haven't done it, um, let's have a very quick um, uh, side, side tour. So if I have um, an integer, if I have an integer A, uh, which is of value 10, and if I have integer B, which is equal to A, and then I change A to B um, 20, um, what will happen to B? Um, B will continue to be 10, right? Uh, because me changing um, that value type uh, doesn't affect all the assignments that I've done afterwards. So I, I basically copied by value, the value of A into B and B became uh, 10. Uh, so B became 10, but me reassigning A doesn't change B. B is still 10, right? Um, so if I were to have B, being updated the same way as A is being updated. I cannot say B is value of A. I have to say B is a reference to A. Uh, and then what will happen is uh, B is a, a reference type. So um, you have integer or you have a reference to the integer and then uh, B is uh, B is of this type and A is of that type, right? Um, so this means B refers to the same memory location as A refers to, and then B, I have to uh, extract the value out of B now, uh, and then the extracted value out of B is 10, right? So it's the, exactly the same as with pointers uh, in C and, and C++. For those of you who had uh, pointers done before, uh, there will be no magic here. It's exactly the same um, with the with people who who never work with pointers. Uh, we have this kind of uh, value types and reference types. And reference types allow us to point to something in memory such that we can manipulate it. And value types just you know they, they are just values. They copy stuff by value. So if I copied um, the original A value to B, uh, I cannot propagate the changes to B, but if I um, copy the reference to A, then changing A will mean uh, B, uh, B became 20, right? And, and B is the reference, so it's not the number 20, B is the reference to A, and to get the value out of the reference, we use the dereference uh, uh, operator. Okay, so now the question is, if we think about this in the context of our DB, um, should I be writing mutation functions on the value types or should I will be writing them on the reference types? And the answer most of the time is reference because 
you don't want those changes to be gone, right? So imagine that I have some field here. I have a field of uh, which is of values uh, of type string. And then if the init uh, says, okay, the DB field is, um, sorry, assignment is uh, initial value, right? Um, so let's, let's have a look what will happen into my program. So here I say format uh, print line db uh, dot field. I wrote it with small f, which means I am not exporting it. So to access it, I have to change the f to capital such that I can see it from my main package. Okay. So now if I say db field, I initialize it and I say format print line db field. Okay, so we have an empty field to start with, and then we initializing it to initial value. Here, we calling it initial value, and then we printing what, what it is afterwards, right? So let's run it, um, save it, run it. And we see nothing. Okay, uh, we see kind of um, nothing. It's not that useful. So let's say um, before after. Okay, sweet. Let's rerun it. Nothing changed. Okay, we failed, right? Because our intention was that after initialization, the field will be initialized, right, to initial value. Uh, and it is, but the moment it is, it's gone because we, what happens is this function is called on the copy of the original DB and then it does what it does. And then the moment this function finishes, the changes are gone. And this refers back to this, right? So for the action to take, um, to be persistent, what we need to do, we have to say, well, we want to actually be operating on the reference on the DB, not on the value of the DB. We don't want to copy by value. We want to grab the handle of the DB, initialize the fields, and then what will happen is, um, so let me save this. Uh, then what will happen is um, the code here, like, uh, let's rerun it. So we see before initialization is empty, after initialization is initialized. So it worked. We didn't change the code here. So what the hell, right? In C++, we would have to change this uh, because operating on the reference or on the value kind of has slightly different notation. Uh, in here, um, this, as you see, this is a value type. It's, it's not a reference. To make it into a reference type, I would have to, so um, let me write here, db is of type db. Uh, if I write db is reference to db db, then, um, in this case, DB is of type reference to DB. Those are two different types, this one and this one. Yet, if I write like this, this one still works because what happens is behind the scene, Golang does this for me. So the language turns the, um, the value type into a reference type to call this method because this method needs a reference type. It says, I want the reference type. I don't want the value type. Um, so this magic happens behind the scene. And then this is just a syntactic sugar, right? So what I'm really doing is I'm doing this, but I don't have to type it like this uh, because Golang allows me to type it like this. 
out of convenience because Golang says, yeah, yeah, I know, I know you want the reference type and not the value, even though this is a value, I will still do this conversion for you, right? Uh, so if I declared it, um, let's say, if I declared it like this, then that is a reference to DB that I'm calling because DB is a reference to DB, right? Does it make sense? Yeah, let's have a break. So, but this is kind of the key element here. Um, you kind of need to understand the difference between reference and uh, value types. And also why this one is now red, because I declare that it will take a value, but I'm actually passing a reference, right? So if I change this one to be a reference, um, sorry, this one to be the value type, this conversion happens to me magically. And then this one works by um, um, by analogy because this is a, a value type and this this is not. So this really what we want is also to be a reference. Then this one stops working. And because we don't want to be referencing, we can be referencing like this, but because I may be calling DB in multiple places, then the most convenient for me is to do this. Okay, so let's have a break. Um, yeah, I will put the comments in exactly. So I will put the comments in that DB is of type um, star DB in this case. And if I say DB is of type DB, well, I can kind of write the package because we are in main. So just not to confuse more, let's do this. So DB. Uh, equals db dot db. Then we have a value type, right? Okay, so let's have a thirteen minutes break. So I will start the timer. Thirteen minutes. Okay. Any other questions? Where can you find the lecture recordings? The lecture recordings you can find if you, sorry, if you navigate to the course and navigate to the wiki. And then in the wiki, it says lectures. Uh, the video link for online lectures is, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the recorded lectures are provided on the playlist. And then if you open the playlist, um, you will see all the cloud course uh, related uh, content, including the Golang lectures. So I can put the Golang lectures in both the PROC 206 and 205, and I'm doing that such that they, uh, they will appear in both of the playlists. So if you just go to uh, lectures, click on the playlist, then you will see the previous lectures. And then after this, I will put um, put one in as well. Yes, there is a link. Uh, there is also a hint from Christopher that we also link the lectures here. So you always have, and I will put the link after today's session here. So you also have the links directly in the lecture, um, lecture details. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions? I don't really know why it was not working with the uh, initial um, student slash DB, why the ID was complaining. Sometimes it's some sort of internal um, ID thing and just you just need to fight through it, um, unfortunately. So as for those comments, because I am, I will swap what I'm doing here. And in the repo, you will have a new code, the one that I've already wrote. Uh, what I will do is I will modify that as well. Students uh, real. Let's see. Let's see my main function.
Yeah, so I've done it slightly differently uh, yesterday. I have a function which returns me a reference to the DB directly. So let me just... Uh, yes, so I abstracted the way out of this into the db Yeah, so this is kind of like an idiom. Yeah, the interesting thing is that that is weird for C programmers. I will talk about it after the break. Okay, so let's... Let's chill out a little bit.
All right. So there was a question. There is a question of how can I distinguish um, between the DB variable and the DB package. Um, most of the time it, it is distinguishable because of the way it is being used such that the uh, compiler is not complaining. So here obviously it's a variable, here it is variable, and here, here and here it's a package, but it's a bad practice. So because my, um, my package is called DB, then naming a variable DB, even though it is legal, like even though it compiles and works, it's a bit confusing and visually it, it is not that nice. So maybe uh, database, maybe I kind of uh, should rename it to, let's say, um, yeah, database is kind of long word though, but database, let's just stick to it then. Okay, so that would be cleaner database. Yeah. So then we have a clear distinction between the DB being a package and then the variable being kind of a variable, right? And this is a variable. Um, okay, so one one comment about the um, the value types and reference types. So I in the uh, in implementation yesterday that I've done, I didn't do this line here. Uh, because uh, this line in the main is a little bit ugly in a sense that it kind of uh, hires, um, hardwires the way you initialize your DB uh, to that particular implementation, right? So even though, yes, we only doing this, it's a little bit nicer if we take this code. Um, so if we take this code and we move it to the, the DB and we have, um, uh, a function which returns us the handle to the DB, right? So if I have a function which is called create DB, it may take some parameters depending like what, what you're doing or some configuration file. And then if you want to do tests, it will return your handle to the uh, test database. If you want to run the real uh, system, the production, it will return a kind of a production. So you kind of do this and then you, um, create your database and then you return so because i kind of create and return it i can i can do it like in one line right so return so this is uh, a, a little bit nicer way of doing this uh, because then i from my code from my main I'm a little bit independent of how I will do that here. And then by using a different parameters, I can kind of uh, generate a different instance or different things for the main. And from the main perspective, all I need is I need a handle uh, to a database and I need this to be created. So I will say create DB, right? So I will have kind of, uh, I refactor the code to be a little bit nicer. So I kind of uh, grab the logic into the function instead. And then this is independent of how actually I'm doing it internally. Um, what sort of structs do I need to communicate with and blah, blah, blah. Um, and this code, as you see here is kind of like an idiom. So I'm creating a value instance of DB and then I'm returning the reference to it, right? Uh, and, and if you think about this, imagine the C function or C++ function F that returns a reference to an int. And in, inside this function, I create an int and then I return a reference to it, right? This is a legal, um, legal code and I can call it. And then what will happen if I try to use P? Anyone, any of the C, C++ people? What will happen? Uh, yeah, Oscar is on a good track. He says null. <laughs> yeah, what you will have is you will have a crash. Uh, you will have a famous memory violation crash. Your program will, you know, burn. Uh, because uh, at that bracket, the space allocated for this on stack is, is freed. So the reference is to kind of already freed space and you're not supposed to use it. You're not supposed to touch it, right? Uh, so this, even though 
it looks like a legal code. We never do that because you cannot return stuff to um, uh, to memory which has been freed already, right? Um, I would have to allocate a dynamic memory, not memory on stack for this to work. Um, but this allocation here is clearly on stack. It's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, um, allocated on the heap, right? So again, those of you who did like a CC++, you have uh, uh, heap allocations, which are kind of all the uh, dynamic allocations with new. And then you have a stack allocations, which are all stuff local variables for your functions. Uh, and this, this variable A is allocated on stack and it, it lives until this bracket. And then when this bracket happens, the, the, you know, it, it's gone. The, the scope finishes and it's, it's, it's gone. So this memory is allocated on, on stack and it's freed, this, mom, this bracket happens. Um, so that means you're not supposed to use the uh, stack allocated memory from here outside of this F, outside of this function. If A was allocated on the heap, so if I said, um, if I said that A is, um, you know, um, oops, I said like new int, right? I allocated uh, the, the A on, uh, on the heap and then assign it the value and then return it. Yes, that would kind of work, but not on the stack. So then that begs a question like, so when you do this, when I do, when I did um, DB, uh, like allocated, because what I'm really doing is this line is exactly the same as this one. So I'm doing DB is a value type allocated on the stack, uh, which is uh, DB. And then I'm returning a pointer to it, right? Um, so I'm kind of doing this, uh, this illegal thing. So this in C, C++ would be allocated on the stack and then that would like broke the logic. In Golang, this allocation, you don't know where it happens. It can be done on the heap or it can be done on the stack, depending what you do later with this reference, with this DB. Because we're returning a reference to the DB, this allocation has to happen on the heap. Um, so this allocation, even though it looks like it's on the stack, it actually happening on the heap. Um, so th this is uh, a little bit of a site. Um, uh, site um, discussion, uh, but I just wanted to uh, warn you that this allocation, even though it looks um, like on the stack that it's local, that db some some variables are local to the function. If you're returning a reference to it, it will actually the GoLang runtime system will allocate it on the heap and it will manage it for you. Um, so, okay, so let's continue. So now. I have my basic skeleton and I need the person, student, teacher, and assistant. Um, so, okay, I need four types and I could, again, I'm asking myself, is it good to have everything in a single file or should I split it into multiple files? Um, if if my, my answer is I want multiple files, the question is, should it all be in the same package or should I want to split it into multiple packages? And I would say, well, the complexity is a little bit too much to have everything in a single file. I will get lost a little bit, what is where, uh, but to have multiple packages, I probably don't need it. So what I will do is I will create a new go, go file. I will call it a person, so person.go, and I will have everything related to a person in that file. So as you see, I will have, um, I will have, DB, which is kind of a generic stuff for my DB. And then I will have person, teacher, student, right? To deal with my, um, so I will create another one. I will call it student. And then um, I will have kind of my data models here. Uh, so in the person, okay, we need a type, right? So we need a person. So we need a type person, uh, which is a struct. And then from the spec, we know we need four things, name, surname, age, a unique ID. So I don't, this is more about just doing um, name, 
string uh, surname string age okay uh, well for uh, for simplicity's sake is an end I don't want to deal with like picking a proper data for data uh, elements it's not the point the point is how you use the types uh, so and then we need a personal ID again I will use int uh, the choice of those two is wrong. Like you should probably not represent age as ints and you should probably not represent personal IDs as ints, but name and surname is probably fine as strings, right? So we have that sorted. Uh, it's a good practice to comment all your public stuff. And in Golang, you start by repeating the, um, the type and say represents a person. Okay, so represents. So that is sorted. Um, a useful thing when you're creating your own structs is to override the default printing of the of the. Um, um, yes, so age and person ID probably should not be ints uh, because that's probably gonna bite you in uh, later on. Well, personal ID should be unique, right? So if you're using ints, you're limiting yourself to managing the ints and what happens if like you have IDs from zero, one, two, three, and then you delete the record, then you will have gaps. Uh, so then you cannot really represent it in arrays because you will have arrays with gaps. So that's kind of ugly, right? Um, so probably personal ID should be a string because then you can use a map to map it. Um, and age, well, you know, if, if we're using int, what, what is it? It's a seconds or is it like uh, days or years or what is it? <laughs> uh, so maybe maybe you need to be more precise how you're representing like duration or, or age, right? So duration is probably a good good one. Uh, and Golang has a time duration and that would be kind of a good as an age. Um, but then maybe you don't want to represent age. Maybe you want to represent, you know, date of birth, and then you can calculate age as a dynamic feature. So there is a lot of you can do with those two, right? <laughs> okay. So how you create a student? Um, so let's go to our main, uh, and we will create a student. Um, so let's have a student S and we have a student and then uh, students live in the db package um, and i didn't create a student yet i created a person so person okay so we have s and then we can say name is bob uh, s age is 21 and s surname is dylan Okay, so now we have uh, Bob Dylan and we can print it. So we can say format print line um, and we can say uh, student, but we don't say anything. We just want to see how it looks like if we uh, print uh, student as is, right? So um, print. Okay, so I'm printing a student uh, and I want to see how Golang formats the default struct, right? So as you see, the struct has not student person, sorry, uh, has one, two, three, four fields. Uh, I didn't override any printing and we created a single person and we kind of are printing it. So let's have a look. So it represents it like this. So it opens curly brace and then it follows the the flow of the uh, uh, of the attributes so name surname age id right well that looks pretty decent uh, but maybe you don't want stuff to be printed like this maybe you have a different idea how you want to represent um, your printouts so then you override a function uh, on the value type so you will have a person p uh, and the function is called string and then this function returns a string and then you can return whatever you would like and what we would like to return is for example something like uh, say uh, that it's a person 
and then in the brackets we say uh, plus um, was it that p dot id and then we close the bracket and then maybe we say name so actually don't say name it just attach the name uh, and I can continue building this expression like this, but as you see, it's a little bit tedious and it's a, a little bit ugly. So it's nicer to use a pattern, right? So I want to say, well, I want a person with the ID and then there will be a name, surname and age in brackets, right? So that will print me a person. It will say person, then I have an ID of the person name surname and age uh no space so to for this to work i have to say format s print and s print is like print but it produces a string instead of dumping it to the to the um to the standard output and then i pass it for parameters so it's a, a person uh, id person name, person surname, and person age. And that will do what I want. And I just want to say it returns it. OK, you can comment that as well. And then if we save it and if we rerun it, we will see how it prints now. Perfect. So it prints our Bob Dylan with index zero, name, surname, age. So great, we have that sorted. Okay, we can um, copy that. Uh, copy and paste programming is not great, but because a student is quite similar, uh, we can probably fudge it. So we will say we have a student. Uh, student represents a student. Okay, and then a student is also a person. Well, it would be pointless for me to repeat the same attributes which are related to a person inside a student. So there is a construct which says you can reuse somebody else's struct uh, inside your own struct such that you benefit from all the fields that are already there. There is a bit of a syntactic sugar for it. So normally what would you do what would you could what you could do in any programming language is to say well a student is a person uh let, let's call it p and then the p is of type person right um so let's see how that would work and then a student has a student id right uh and then if we are printing a student student then we have we say it's a student student we print a student id and then to print a name we would have to say p dot name p dot surname and p dot h right it works so we have now encapsulated the uh data structure of a person inside a student without repeating it and without inheritance, right? We, we do it by delegation. So anything to do with a person is delegated to P and anything to the student goes directly to student, right? Um, because this, this intermediation of P is such a common pattern and because this kind of pattern is very typical of extending existing structs, Golang has a syntactic sugar for it. Um, before I do the syntactic sugar, um, let's ask ourselves, is P here, should P here be value type or should it be a reference type? Any comments? So if I'm saying I have a student and student is a person, um, should I use a value type or should I use a reference type? So all students are people, all students will be, will be person, but not all persons will be students. What will happen when a student graduates? Will the student 
continue to be a person? Yes. So we probably need to keep track of all the people and all the students because the student is kind of really like a um, um, category of people, right? So when I will have my database and in our database, we have this useless field. Um, I really like normally you could do like accessing the database by going to a real database, but because I, I'm kind of mocking it, I will use a, a slice. So I will have a slice of persons and I will say, I will call it people. So I have kind of a, a slice of all the people that I'm keeping track of. Um, and then I don't really need to initialize it. And then if I have a student to, to be a person, um, I don't really, um, like, I would like to be able to store students and people. And then if the person changes something, like let's say the person changes a name, the student attached to that person also changes the name, right? So if I use it by value, I will have a person in my person's database, in my table. And then if I change it, the student name will not get changed because this one is by value. So it will be a copy of the, of the record of the person, right? So actually it will be ben more beneficial for me to use it by reference in such a way that if I, I need to change data only in one place, and it propagates across all my tables, like if you think SQL like, right? So in reality, I would like to this to be a reference and this to be uh, students, student, right? So now I have um, two tables. In one, I'm keeping all the people and in one, I'm keeping all the students. The IDs of people will be the indexes in the array and the indexes of students will be the student IDs. And then the student is by reference. So now, as I said, this still works. Uh, so I, I saved it and that still works. And it works because now the, the even though P is a reference, um, Golang does this for me, um, right? It dereferences the um, dereferences the p uh, out of this because this is a reference type now. So actually, I'm not calling name on p. I'm calling name on the dereferenced p, right? Um, but because again, I go go like kind of uh, cheats, so I can call name on the reference and it dereferences it for me. And because it's such a common pattern, you can actually delete the P. So you can delete the P altogether. Okay. And suddenly you live in a world where you almost have inheritance like in uh, Java or C++, right? So I'm saying student is a person. The person is the reference actually to the, to the other record, to the other struct. And then when you're using it, you're using it as nice as, as if you did have this kind of uh, hierarchy, right? Does it make sense so far? I hope so. Um, so we have now, okay, if almost what, what, uh, what is unclear, what do you need to know? Questions, ask me questions. So we get rid of this, we get rid of this. Um, we can create a person, we can create student in the same fashion, right? You see, I can, I can create student the same way. Uh, and now a student has two things. Student has a student ID, let's, let's say it's zero. And the student has also personal ID, let's call it zero as well, right? So I have two IDs, one for a student and one for a person if I'm creating a student. If I create a person, a person doesn't have a student ID. A person only has personal ID, right? Okay, so that works um, pretty nice. Uh, printing also works quite nice. We've overwritten the, the print functions. Um, 
the processing commands will work like this, that it will read. Uh, so this, this function um, reads a line from a command line uh, and then do something with it, right? So as you see from the spec, um, I have to be able to, uh, okay, let, let's not do the spec, let's uh, uh, students. So let's see the help here. So I have a couple of commands, like one is adding a person and adding a student. And then the add person takes uh, a string, which is like a name, surname, and age. So th this, the whole line is a, is a, is a string. And what I want is I want to tokenize it into the command and then all the arguments for the command. If the command is end, I will finish. If the command is at person, I will extract this out of the string and I will pass those things as strings, as you know, uh, strings into my create student or create person uh, function, right? So what I want is I will, in, uh, let's do it for person first. I will have, I would like to have a function which works um, in such a way that it creates create person and my create person function um, will work on the database because I need to inject that new person. Well, maybe I don't, maybe I just create a person and return it, right? So I will return a person by value. Okay, so let's do that first. And this function takes um, data, which is in a form of a, a slice of strings. So I will have, as, I, as I'm showing you here, I will have a string like this, and then I will say, okay, uh, split it into the single words. And this is a string, this is a string, this is a, this is a string, and this is a string. And then I will get rid of the first one, and I will pass to this function those three tokens, which are the name, surname, and age, right? Um, so what happens if you want someone to be both student and assistant? Uh, yes, that's a good question. So what will happen is I don't have an assistant yet, but uh, it will be the same as with the uh, teacher and with the student. So let me go to main. Um, let me go. Uh, yeah, yeah, how it can do it quickly. Let's create an assistant. Uh, new go file assistant dot go small a. Okay, and we have we have a type. And the type is assistant and it's a struct and it's also a person and an assistant is has an assistant ID, right? And assistants also have an account. So account to which we can pay. Uh, so let's represent cash as floats. Again, you probably don't want to be doing those two things like this but for the sake of demonstration, why not? Uh, so now the question is, um, you want to have, so now you want to have, uh, let's say Bob, and Bob is a person, and Bob is a student, and Bob is also an assistant, right? So what will happen is you will have, um, so you, you will have Bob as a person, so you can say person, so Bob is a person. And then you will say Bob as an assistant and you say DB assistant. Um, and you will see Bob as a student. Student. And the way it needs to be wired up is in such a way that the person the, the P that doesn't exist, the P that doesn't exist out of the, um, 
um, out of the person is wired up to the original person. Um, so I will I will uh, show you how to do that. So let's create. We yeah we need the um, we need those constructors. So there was another uh, another question. Uh, uh, how how you do the default constructors and how you construct the the entities. So um, now we're creating a person first. So create a person. Okay. So a person comes first, uh, and we basically need to kind of create the person out of this data that we have, uh, and then uh, return it um, return it into the um, into the struct, right? So what I will do is I will say I have a person P. So person and then P name is easy. That's the data zero P surname is easy. It's data one and then P H is a bit tricky because H is int and string two is, um, is H but as a string. Here we have to do some sanity checks. So if the length of data is different than three, well, you know, somebody passed us wrong data, right? So I will talk about error handling on Wednesday. Here we just panic and say uh, wrong number of arguments to create person. Um, and then once we get to this point, we have to get um, integer out of the string. So we do that by saying, well, there is an H and an error, and we get it from string conversion ASCII to integer, and we passing data to, and if error is not nil, again, error handling, here we just panic. Um, the H is not a proper integer. And then if it is, then H equals H. And then we have a person and then we can return the person P. So we created a person um, and we need to do similar thing for the um, for the student. Uh, why I would like to have database being in this method, uh, as you see, I have an instance of a person, but the person doesn't have an ID because I didn't inject the, the, the person into the database. So I don't know what the ID that person has. So for the person kind of to work better, I would like to use the, the handle to the DB. So I will say it's a method on top of the DB handle uh, that creates a person. Uh, and what I will do is I will check, uh, I will say uh, personal ID is the current uh, index of the, of how many persons I have in my database. So DB person people, um, will return me how many I already have. If I have zero, then it will be zero, right? And I will append uh, db people with the new person that I just created and that will become db people. db people is appended extended one, right? So we started with an empty one and then we check, okay, how big is the current people list? It's empty, so zero. Uh, we add people onto that empty list. I mean, by doing this append and then we created this method creates a new list which has this person P appended to, to the empty list. And then that becomes my new list. And I'm returning the person and because I may, be, I may want to do something with that person. I probably should return a reference to that person instead, right? So I will say I'm returning, I'm returning a reference to P. 
And now P already has the personal ID, right? Because it's already uh, attached properly um, to, to that person. Um, Yes, so what the question is about my uh, my um, parameters here. So the, the F, the print F, print F and S print F, uh, they take kind of a pattern uh, and the V is a kind of a value type. So it converts whatever value I give, like in that case, I'm giving kind of um, integers. So integer is not a string. So V takes whatever you pass it, and converts it to a string. It, it automatic makes an automatic conversion to a string. And S represents a string. So I, I'm saying the first, whatever I pass to you, convert it to a string. The second and third one will be strings already. So you don't need to do any conversions, just put them in here. And then the final one is an integer, so convert it to a string, right? So those are kind of the um, conversions of what you're passing to it uh, to get um, um, printed. There, there is one which is, I think, T, and that will print you a type. And you can check what other uh, conversions you have. If you search for print F, it will list you all those um, S and V's um, parameters. OK, so that works. Um, and I will kind of do the same uh for a student so i have to do the same for a student now let's say so in student i have to do the same so i will say you can create a student automatically um, it will automatically create a person, right? So create student creates a student, but we know a student inherits from a person. So we want uh, a person to be in the database and a student to be in the database. So first, we basically creating a person, right? So all this code, um, the students have basically the same data, right? It's a name, surname, age. There is nothing extra for a student. So what I will do is I will say, P is uh, create person, and I'm passed, I will pass the data to that function, and it will give me a reference. It will give me a reference to a newly created person, and the person will be already injected in the database, right? Uh, because that method did that. And now the student needs to be inheriting from all the fields that the, the person has. So you do that by creating a student. Uh, so let's say I have S, which is a student. And now I have to say S person is P, right? So all the fields that person has and student inherited from a person are basically already kind of defined here in P and they are inherited, right? So remember this, this notation? I could have this shortcut as P, in which case I would have to say this, uh, right? It works. And then there is a syntactic sugar by me saying, OK, forget about P. It will inherit all the fields, and I can use them directly. And that's this one. So P is gone. But to do this assignment, uh, I have to have a, a kind of a field. I have to have a variable. And that variable is basically that type. So the whole type becomes the kind of the, the field variable, which allows me to inherit all the stuff from the other uh, data structure, right? Uh, this check needs to be first check in the, in the function, because if we pass the wrong number, we have to blow up. And it's for create student, student. And then we're creating a person, creating a student, doing that. We don't need to do any of this. We don't need to do any of this. We don't need to do any of this. But we need to do, uh, let me undo the last delete. I cannot. So let me say S student ID is length of DB students. 
uh, and then I'm adding to students. I'm adding the S students and S. Correct. So Yeah, so there are two questions. Uh, one question is how do you find all the roles of a, of a single person? Uh, and that would require me uh, iterating over those um, data structures. So I have so I have assistants also. So assistants is uh, assistant. Okay, so then the question is, okay, if I, for a given person, like person ID zero, find me all students and all like uh, find me all roles which that person is in. So then I would have to linearly search this to find which of these has a person ID the same as I'm searching for and iterate over this, right? So I would have to do two iterations. Uh, searching for all the roles of a person is not in the spec, right? So the spec only said, model uh, the data in such a way that certain entities are certain categories and then uh, model the payments. Uh, so the search was not um, specified. And if the uh, search was a requirement, maybe I would re redesign the data structures to be slightly differently modeled here, right? Um, Yeah, so Christian is suggesting how about keeping a person holding kind of a, a role object and having kind of the different roles being uh, being uh, specified there. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated because the roles have extra data associated with the roles. So it's not just that a person is a teacher because teachers have budgets and they can pay. Uh, people cannot pay and people don't have budgets. Uh, assistants have accounts to which we can pay, right? So modeling things as a single flat structure with the uh, roles could become a bit cumbersome, especially if you want to extend stuff, right? If I want to say, well, assistants can uh, have sub assistants, right? So I can say sub assistants um, and then have a list of assistants, right? Then I can easily do uh, assistant. I can easily do that here. Uh, and then with the roles, yeah, it may or may not be that, that simple, right? So the data modeling here is not the main point. The main point is like how you can have inheritance of certain fields and certain behaviors and attributes uh, without the inheritance being in Golang. Uh, and how can you model these relationships and how can you access those kind of a sub, uh, sub fields? So I don't repeat those uh, data anywhere else apart from the person. You see like our students don't have it and assistants don't have it, but assistants have other things which people don't have, right? Otherwise, if I, if I keep everybody in a single table, then I would have kind of a data redundancy. Um, some other questions? Yeah, so name is teacher and assistant. Yes, that is in the, um, uh, that is possible to do. You can, uh, so if I, if I create kind of here, so, so uh, add person and I, uh, I didn't edit Marius Johansson. Yeah. Uh, and then I have, um, at another person, uh, Bob Dylan. Um, and then I say make teacher, uh, Bob. Uh, Bob is a uh, first person because index is from zero. And then make assistant also one, right? So if I, so Bob now is a teacher and an assistant, right? And I can see list teachers. There will be a Bob. So Bob is a teacher and I can say list assistants. And I also have Bob.
So both can be a, a both. Um, and uh, a person can also be a student. So I can make a, Bob a student as well. So make student uh, zero. Yeah, I don't have that function implemented, but it is possible uh, to do the same way as I'm doing assistants and teachers to make a student. Uh. All right, we all went over time. Uh, what I will do is I will uh, commit the whole uh, project such that you can play with it. Um, I will just demonstrate something for you. Um, let's say, um, uh, who is a student? So uh, at student and no, I need, a, I need another teacher, so make, uh, Marius was zero, so make teacher um, zero as well. So list teachers. I have two teachers and list assistants. And the assistant is Bob Dylan, and Bob has not been paid anything. So Bob, um, as you see, has an account zero, and Marius has an account hundred. So if Marius, so um, pay teacher index, so pay one, is paying assistant index zero, and it pays 50, uh, 15 euro. Um, that will work. And then if I list assistants, uh, you will see that Bob doesn't get money. So there is a bug which says, well, everything sort of works, but you know, Bob doesn't get money. And if I list teachers, uh, you will see that the money from Marius are gone, right? So the money disappeared. The money are subtracted from a teacher, but they never appear on the assistant account. So if you find the bug, you can submit a pull request into the code and which fixes the, which fixes the bug. So you will get brownie points if you do that. So thanks a lot. Uh, on Wednesday, we will um, continue with the discussion on concurrency uh, and some uh, interfaces. We didn't use uh, any interfaces here, and I will show you how you can use it to achieve some polymorphic behaviors. OK? So thank you very much, and see you on Wednesday. Yeah, thanks.